Welcome to the Prime Venture Partners podcast. This is a special year end 2021 episode. We had almost 30 guests on the podcast this year, over 100,000 playbacks of all the episodes. We had folks who are entrepreneurs, serial entrepreneurs, CEOs, and an interesting new category this year. We had a lot of authors who write about startups and entrepreneurship. It was a fabulous journey both for us to learn as well as our listeners to listen and learn to what these guests had to say. As we looked through all the episodes, there were a couple of big themes that stood out. One, the most downloaded episodes were really focused on two areas. One is building and growing your startup. The second one is identifying the opportunities. Of course, at Prime, we're working with and helping early stage entrepreneurs on both building a startup, growing the opportunities, as well as bringing some of these conversations to help grow yourself as a founder, co-founder, or CEO of your company. So without further ado, please enjoy the year-end special for 2021. What people's problems are we solving? How do we know it's a real problem? How will we know if we've solved it? This was a beautiful framework I picked up from Julie Zhu, one of our guests and the former head of design at Facebook, now Meta. She's, of course, running her own company now. We also had some very interesting episodes around customer discovery. It was just a delight to see the customer obsession that Vidit of Misho had, and he talks about how he's cultivated that in his company. Vivek Sinder, then the COO at Swiggy and now the CEO of QMath, talked a lot about his learning from his FMCG and consumer background to the tech internet startup world. One of the most downloaded episodes was the one with Shreyas Doshi, which he talks about some amazing frameworks on exploring and accelerating product market fit. Well, you could do whatever with product if your customer doesn't realize how you belong in their worldview, what is the positioning of your company, that'll be a challenge. That was something very interesting from April Dunford that I recollect. Finally, there's a lot that we talked about in terms of building organization culture. And in particular, I remembered one with Donna Wixess from Coupa Software. And we had some amazing sets of insights from Prime's entrepreneurs themselves. I vividly remember the episode with Shihab Muhammad of Survey Sparrow, where he talks about a minimum usable product as well as the one with the inspirational dozy founders about solving the world's health problems. So check out a bunch of these snippets from many, many episodes around building your company. Let's say now you've figured out that your problem is the problem, which is one of the top three or five problems that your your prospective customers have. And now you're going about building your MVP one or MVP two. Let's talk about the build part of the journey. And again, looking at early stage startups, are there any kind of thoughts that you have on figuring out your iterating your way to the product market fit? This is more on the build side. So now you, you're working on that problem. Now you need to go figure out, is it really solving the customer's problem? And you, you don't want to wait six months and you don't want to do it after every sprint uh, either. So how do we go about seeking PMF in the build phase? Yeah, I love that question. And this can be uh, something we go on for hours and hours on its own. Perhaps I can start with a couple of thoughts here and then we can see what's most interesting. One approach I like, and sometimes I just do it by myself. I I don't need to do it as part of a group exercise, although it can certainly be done as part of a group exercise, is before we start building, now assume we've understood the problem and we have some vague idea of a solution. Before we start building, I like to simulate a a conversation between a customer of mine, this future customer or, or user of my product, and a friend. The setting may be the friend expresses some problem they are facing in their life, whether it's business or personal life. So the friend expresses a problem to which my product is a very viable solution or, or should be a very viable solution. So now how might this customer of my product respond to that prompt. So maybe the customer says, oh, you should totally use Shreyas's product, uh, right? And so the friend will ask, well, I've never heard of it. What does it do? Okay. And so that is the prompt, which is, 
what is the one sentence that this customer of my product says in response that is both factually accurate and compelling enough that the friend's reaction is, oh, I should totally check that out, right? So that's the problem. And it's a very simple exercise, uh, but it is so profoundly useful. And I've often observed there will be entire teams that have been working on a product for uh, years that sometimes find it hard to articulate a very clear and compelling value proposition as part of this exercise. So I like to work backwards and figure out what that sentence is going to be. And then the product work that we do over the next six months or three months or 12 months, whatever it is, is just about making that sentence actually true, right? So that's a good place to start. Of course, it doesn't solve all your problems. You still have to build the product. But I think getting that clarity up front is really vital. I found this interesting kind of framework I saw you speak about, which is how how a Facebook designer thinks. And it has three questions. What people problem are we solving? How do we know it's a real problem? And how will we know if we've solved for it? Uh, Certainly the first two are pretty relevant. But when you're being inundated with, let's do photo tagging, let's do newsfeed, let's do like button. And I'm sure there were like a million other things. How do you pick what to do? both as a combination of gut and data, if you can talk us through that and, and this more relevant to apply it to more early stage or early growth companies. Yeah, I, I go back to that framework all the time. Good ideas for features for products come from everywhere. They come from observing someone using their product. They come from internal engineers, PMs, designers, like everybody has ideas. And so we go back to that framework. It used to be what would happen is that sometimes someone would say, Hey, I've got a great idea for a product. We should do X. Before we get into thinking about X, what is X? Is X, you know, how should you you implement X or what should it look like? That's where the first question that you just quoted kind of came in. Instead of focusing on the solution, we first need to ask ourselves, well, what problem are people having? And let's just make sure we really understand that problem because we can't just go into the solution if we don't quite have alignment on what is the actual problem. And the second question helps us understand the priority of that problem. So the second question is, how do we know it's a real problem? And maybe another way to think about it is how also how big of a problem is it? Because is it just a problem for you? Are you this special niche user that's very techie and you really want it to work a certain way but you're like one of 10 people who want that. I mean, that's a real problem for you perhaps, but it's just not a real problem in the sense of like many, many people have this problem. So the second question is meant to try and help us quantify what is the, let's say, depth or extent or scope of how bad this problem is. And Ideally, we can pick on the things that are real problems that we can understand them and are pretty big opportunities or big problems that when you give people a solution or you give people a better way, they're just like, yes, that's absolutely what I want. And that really resonates with me. So those two questions are meant to help us with that level of prioritization. And the third question, how will we know if we've solved it, is to try and keep us honest on what behaviors or what would we see that would give us indication that whatever we came up with was successful. And it sometimes fights against this bias that we all naturally have. Sometimes we think we understand the problem. We think it's a big problem. We build something and we're looking, we're biased. So so we're always looking for like reasons to believe that we did we did well, right? We're looking for any positive sign of like, oh yes, this person said something good. And we tend to latch on to the positive feedback much more so than we might be willing to look at or admit the negative feedback or the graph that isn't growing or whatever it is. And so by trying to define the criteria of what success looks like, what would we have seen in the behavior? What would people have told us? What would have changed about their habits or whatnot? By trying to ask that question way up front, we try and make it so that we have a more objective criteria set up at the beginning. So we're not like looking at a bunch of metrics after the fact and then trying to you know piece it together and into the best possible interpretation. One thing that is common across all of the kind of pivotal moments in the company is you're constantly engaged with the users. Literally from what you were saying about Fashioner to the first idea of they're running WhatsApp groups, men or mostly probably these shopkeepers would have been men to these women running these WhatsApp boutiques, etc. And I also noticed while preparing for this podcast that you have a 
program in the company called Listen or Die or some such thing, which is that, look, you have to talk to users no matter who you are. It doesn't have to be only the product managers or the salespeople or whatever. So is that a really core kind of value at Misho? Like in terms of even now when you've scaled up to millions, if not tens of millions of businesses that are working with you and so forth? Yeah. So, and I was coming to that. Basically, if you see the only common thread across is all of our ideas have ever come when we have been close to the user. It never comes while we are brainstorming on some whiteboard in office. It has never yeah. come while we are discussing it with someone or on an Excel sheet. It almost 110% of the times always comes from the user. And this has happened every single year. By the way, this is like the zero to one journey. But every single year, whenever we have found some very powerful insight, it has always come from the users. And that's why like in our nine values in the company, the first value is what we call it the user first value. And listen or die, which you referred to, is the exact same thing, which is all new people who join the company are supposed to speak to users. Every project, by the way, that we do, everyone, before they come and present what they're doing, they have to essentially have like few slides just talking about, and they are like their term listen or die in the company. All those slides where they talk about what did the user say about this? Because I think we realize this more than anyone else. If you are building a product which is not for yourself, like in our case, we did not ourselves use this product. We were not homemakers and we were not these women and we were not these small businesses. So from day one, I think that realization was very strong that we are not building this product for ourselves, which also means it is very, very hard to build a good intuitive or a judgment around this particular product because we need to build it for someone else. And we overcompensated for that by staying extremely close to users. For the first, I would say five years, I used to have all of our top users on my WhatsApp list, every single one of them. And they used to use me as like the support center. A product is delayed, they will reach out to me. If something happens, they will reach out to me. And I wanted that direct channel because that was extremely useful for us while we are building like newer and newer things. So in summary, I would say it's extremely important. And I would say, again, this would become important for all new entrepreneurs when first they're building for a customer that is at least not them. Like, because this is the only way you get access to insights. Or second, when you're building something very bottoms up, like very fundamental, very bottoms up. If you're building something, if you're building a category defining company, like you're building something new, again, I believe it will always and always come from the user. There's no way you can figure out these insights from anywhere else. So, Kinder, so you had a fascinating journey, but I have to start with your book, Choose Possibility, because so, it talks okay. about very many things from, you know, your own managing your own career to managing risk to, you know, trading off risk versus reward. So can you mm -hmm. talk to us a little bit about some of the stories around risk taking as it pertains to early stage entrepreneurs, right, or early stage startups? How would you define it? How would you take some of the frameworks in the book that you've got, like building your risk muscle and so forth? How would you help people think about cultivating those? So I think one of the things to note is, you know, there's a self-fulfilling prophecy one might say, which is if you started an early stage company, you probably are already chose possibility at least once. To choose possibility is my you know, framework for thinking about risk taking. However, and I think this is one of the big frameworks in the book, if you think it's about choosing once between risk and reward, you're in for a big surprise because often the, the path between risk and reward is fairly nonlinear and it's the result of many choices. Again, that may be obvious to an early stage entrepreneur, but when we are in it, literally in it and trying to find product market fit, the question for us really, and you know this, is the, the feedback loops we use to figure out where the unlock might be. So that I would say is maybe the obvious thing from the book. I think for early stage entrepreneurs, though, often the question is, what are smart risks to be taking and what are risks not worth taking? That's one I see often. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. The other one I see is, how do I train everybody else in my company to take some risk? Because I say to people in early stage um, companies, the founder is doing it all. They're taking all the risk in some ways. Everybody looks to them and they take the risk. But every founder I know, and I've been a founder three times, as you know, Yodley, Joyous in the board list. I know that what I always wish is like, well, wait, how does everybody else around me, you know, take risk and act like owners? Am I the only one who's supposed to be doing all this? And I know many founders who are listening to this can relate to this feeling like, well, if my company's going to scale, it can't all be me. So I think we also have to take other people to take risk. So let me come back to the former and then I'll go to the latter. I think while it's obvious, as I said, to get into an iterative loop, if you're a noise stage founder, I think talking about the smart risks to take as the founder the ones I think about most broadly and most importantly from the book 
or what I call put the who over the what. I think often founders want to hire people who, let's say, have done it all before. I've seen this pattern. You know, somebody will walk in and has the resume for the exact job you want, right? But when you think about prioritizing who you hire, I always say, think about two or three things. Number one, if you want to take smart people risks in trying to, you know, unlock impact faster, the first and foremost is look for diverse skills to your own, not homogeneity. This is a really important one. I think most people like want to hire somebody who looks like them, but then you end up with a company of engineers who all may get along fabulously, but you're trying to find product market fit and there's nobody who understands demand and you wait too long to make that hire. Again, I've seen that's a problem. Number two, you know, I hire, interestingly, if I want to hire people who can take risks in my own companies, I'm looking for people who have agility and who have a track record that demonstrates usually at this stage, small and maybe some large. And you say, well, why large companies? And it's because they actually, at large companies, once you already have product market fit, you tend to see a talent. You tend to know what a talent looks like. So I like hiring people who've come out of large companies, but I want to see that they've done small companies too. I want to see that they've had both failures and successes. And I think we often think that risk-free hire is the person who's done the job before and the person who's come from a track record of only success. And I would challenge that because I think if you want to hire people who have agility and who can get into a feedback loop quickly without you needing to tell them, like they know how to unlock and solve the next problem, you're looking for people, I think, who've shown that agility in their own career, including failure. And I don't think that's an obvious smart risk for people to take. They think the smartest person to hire is the one who's done it all before. And I can tell you that people who are only used to success may not have the agility that you're used to. So that's, I think, a really smart and important risk. And then when I think it comes to teaching other people to take risk in your organization, I think one other thing I find very useful, and again, I have a lot of empathy for this because I'm a founder with strong opinions. I always say to people, if you walk into a room with no vision, you're going to leave with my vision. And by the way, that makes me really happy because I get to say everything I have in my head. It's not a particularly empowering or scalable way to train other people to take risk. So I think as a founder, I would say, you need to think about when you're the author. And most of the times as founders, we're always the author. And again, I understand that in early product market fit, but for an early stage entrepreneur to even be able to get to the next level, you have to be able to hire smart people. And we talked about them, people who are agile. Guess what? People who are agile, they don't necessarily want you telling them like everything that needs to be done. You have to leave some space for them to author. And so when you think about authorship versus what I call being a publisher, one of the early and smart ways to help other people take risks is to literally consciously think about when are you going to move your brain from author to publisher. For somebody like me, it's something as simple as like, hey, when we have a one-on-one, can you please bring an agenda? Because I know that automatically shifts the onus to them. And you're like, oh, an agenda is bureaucratic. I'm like, an agenda is not bureaucratic. An agenda is a way for the person coming in the room I don't care if it's on Google Docs. I don't care if it's three bullet points. Like organize your thoughts. Come in with what you want to say. Because when you come in and you're just waiting for me to tell you what to say, guess what? Like we'll have that conversation. And I don't think founders realize how much the tactics they use really influence the ability of other people to author. You have to think about whether or not you're creating space for people to take a risk. I got your point about don't hire too prematurely. You're setting yourself up for failure. Don't hire without the culture fit and the getting the you know body and the organ both ready for it yeah. but oftentimes we also find that and maybe this is more true for early stage than later stage people will just keep holding on to it and therefore it becomes too late to get people in i am a you know practitioner of product management and engineering and so on the founder wants to be the product manager for 12 years and there is a point where you go look you know, either this is not going to work or something else that you're supposed to do as CEO or co-founder or whatever is not happening. Or maybe you're not the best skilled person. Is, is there any just quick thought on that before we jump about hiring too late as well? Just like the inverse of the premature hiring that you talked about. Yeah, I think it's a great point. I'm sorry. I, I did think it was a pre, it was an incomplete answer to say don't hire too early. I actually truly believe that if you hire too late, um, then maybe the, you know, staying on the medical analogy, then, you know, the, la- the that that organ which basically needed a transplant has just uh, made the rest of the body suffer. I mean, sort of stretching the analogy here, but you're absolutely right. So there is an appropriate and op- optimum time to bring in. And it, maybe it is a sweet spot, uh, whether it is Series X or Series Y, I'm not getting into, uh, because that depends on the scale of the company and the nature of the space it operates in. Uh, also, it, I think, depends on how fast is the learning curve of the founder himself or herself. But I think that maybe too late is when a certain 
rigidity has set in for that company that this is just how we have done sir, stuff this is why we've been successful so far uh, and in, actually more importantly more rigidity not on this is why we've been successful so far because kudos to you for being successful in where you are more the rigidity on oh we have tried this stuff and it doesn't work i think that's the rigidity which becomes very difficult for anybody coming in new so most of the people who were actually having to do this didn't hear the sort of you know bird on the shoulder saying but we have tried this before and it's not worked and stuff like that i think that was a excellent sort of behavior and this is part of the whole preparing the body so i think it is before the rigidity set sets in i don't know whether there's a good way to measure this i, I think there's a maybe there's an i'll use an inversion sort of theory every 6 months because things happen fast in a startup every 6 months you got to ask yourself the question saying if everybody in the i mean founders will play different roles like some somebody will be a cto somebody will be a cpo somebody will be a ceo and so on but i think you have to ask yourself the question saying if this company was hiring a cxo whatever that's xb would it hire me and if the answer to that question and by the way you shouldn't ask yourself that question because you'll have all positive and negative biases about yourself some people may be too humble and say no of course i'll never get hired and some people may swing on the other side you should basically actually have a formal sort of almost a search committee saying would it hire me and if the answer to that question is no like unequivocally no then you should basically say i'm sort of screwing this baby up by basically doing that job absolutely and, and again it's the same story on on cricket let's be honest i mean i i know how to play better cricket than my son right now but i'm going to be a shit coach so i should quickly get out of the way yes and let him learn from a real coach because i know i'm better than him because of course he's much younger and so on and so forth but i'm not going to be a good coach so i know that fact that me getting in the way of letting him not see a quick quick coach early is actually in a way not me being a good father and not loving him if i love him so dearly i should let him go to an expert the the gurukul system almost facilitated that it says look don't assume that a parent is going to know so many things just send him off and you will find that he's going to learn much better uh, because your true love is when you actually make that person learn even better and make you better than you so i do think that your point about thinking about when it's too late is an equally valid one and maybe we make mistakes on that side too has the process of quote unquote dating and finding interesting smart motivated people whether they are co-founders or others that you bring on changed for you across these 3 4 journeys that you have taken so there are many entrepreneurs that we have on listening possibly to the show were first time entrepreneurs they don't have that experience they're like i just want to go make my first big successful company or get an exit or make a unicorn so i'm i'm trying to see if they can learn something from your journey yeah. another amazing question because i didn't think about it until you said this but yes there have been learnings and i would say there are two points one is a more trivial point which is uh, the amount of people that come to me now wanting to talk about an idea that is worth taking up together has increased simply because of the past credibility but as a first time entrepreneur what is it that one can look for and i can tell you that having gone through it enough my thinking has evolved a lot on this topic the number one thing i found is the people who are in the the first 5 10 employees are the ones you're going to spend a lot of time with and you better better really have a frequency match on your value system i think that is number one it sounds very hand wavy but you can figure it out when you spend enough time with people is how do you view the same situations do you view it similarly or do you view it very differently how would you act in certain situations and that's something i would never have done as much as i do it now because there have been times where a, a potential co-founder was very smart technically could write up code could solve problems in hours and others would take months but the values match was not there and then that shows up in very ugly ways later on so it's not worth it you need to get that values match up front that's the first thing and the second thing is each person involved in the early days has to be clear about what they bring to the table as well as what they are willing to trust the other person with and they are two very different things because i can bring something but then what you bring to the table i'll constantly question you and i and it's okay to question but not question in a way that you don't know what you're doing are you willing to truly truly trust and you can question but question from a place of i know what you're doing but this is more for me to understand versus i don't trust anything you're doing 
but whatever i'm doing is amazing right you know it's you have to have both aspects and so this is something i did not even think about in the early days right but now i understand that for the long term benefit of the company it is critical that uh, you do those aspects as well so i want to talk about building brands you guys had to fend off against large global competition on an open internet uh, sort of model so whether it was monster.com or linkedin or indeed and so on and so forth and and yet you won right i mean i mean it's always a battle but nonetheless you are a large standalone profitable growing company so can you talk to us a little bit about that in terms of what were some of the lessons learned some of the secret sauces maybe some of the because our our listeners here are young early stage entrepreneurs maybe even growth stage ones now so maybe some lessons and some thoughts from that journey yeah you know we've always had the competition and it's always been global competition for us and for a while it's always scared us because in the early days we had monster and monster was a big global daddy in those days they were in 32 countries they were a leader in all i think 28 or 30 of them and they were at that point in time valued at 6 billion dollars and they were very profitable and growing and they came to india very early on we raised money just one and a half two years back and we had not even started sort of we had not even become a decent business and they were already in india and they acquired the number two player at that time jobs ahead and they were very acquisitive and i think one thing one call we took at that time was one to not sell to monster we said nee nee yaar this is something we wanted to build i mean like i said we were not thinking you can we were not thinking valuation we were just thinking of building a small business for ourselves and making it profit we said listen yaar yeah, what will we do if we sell to monster <laughs> let's build our business so that was one call which really nearly went our way it turned out to be the right call in the end for a while there was a lot of action and monster was like i said they were aggressive they were a serious marketing company and they spent a lot of money on advertising they acquired the number two player but luckily for us some things worked out we kept growing we became profitable we went public and then in 2008 um, when lehman hit everybody i think that in 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 the short term we were seriously impacted we were growing at 40% per annum let's say before lehman then we went to minus 25% uh, for three quarters after that but on hindsight you no know, monster was impacted even more because they were a global company and they got impacted in every market and post lehman we realized that we were actually you know it was a good opportunity for us to gain market share the monster slowed down and then then they went through a couple of management changes and so on and we became a big leader in india by a wide margin till then we were almost like 5 7% ahead of monster and so on and then but come 2011 12 we had sort of created a big gap between us and them but then you had linkedin and then you had indeed uh, and you know i remember in the very early days uh, indeed was when it was an independent company that had not been acquired by recruit of japan which is a very large company uh, but when they were independent they were an aggregator and they had approached us so because see the aggregation model was take listings from everywhere and become the largest listing site and they approached us and we thought very hard about it and i think one of the best decisions we took at that time was not to give them our listings there was a temptation to to get more traffic for free because that's the, the promise they sort of uh, made to listen you know we'll get traffic and and you'll get that traffic for free but i think that was a wise decision because in the end they got sold to a recruit after a few years and recruit became like a traditional job board they converted indeed into a traditional job board and luckily for us we had not one we did not give them our listings to we learned from them on how they were getting their traffic from seo and a few other things which they were doing which we were not so good at and so that was i think again in my view a narrow escape because you know in our kind of businesses if you lose even 5 10 to 15% share it can really hurt and one of the reason we get the valuation we get and the reason we get the pricing with reason we command the pricing we command in mark with customers is because we are a clear leader and then when linkedin happened again it was a, a seminal moment because see linkedin was a very different animal and for a while we didn't know what, how to react with linkedin because they were a networking platform not a, a listing platform and we had no answer and we did our a few things we tried our hand at networking etc and then enough people there were enough noises in the room and they said maybe nokri should transform itself into a linkedin kind of site should become a networking site etc etc luckily for us again good sense prevailed and we said listen that's not the answer we can't become a linkedin so let's invest in product and technology and improving the user experience on the nokri platform there was a call we took a few years ago and then that's how we ramp start ramping up our investments for our technology and user experience on nokri and i think it's really worked out for us so switching gears now talking about your role as a product leader not just as a product manager or an entrepreneur seeking pmf and going to talk a little bit about allocating capital in a ceo sense so what products or projects do you decide to double down on and which are the ones do you prune one of my favorite interview questions i used to always ask product managers or product leaders is what are you going to eliminate 
as opposed to what are you going to add? This is, of course, assuming that you've scaled and you've got PMF and you're growing and so forth. So how do you do capital allocation decisions in terms of how many engineers or PMs to staff up on things or, or even prune things because their time has passed now? Yeah, and this problem comes up often in the really fast growth phase of a product. Okay, you proved product market fit. And now there are so many different directions you can go in. You have a very healthy pipeline of customers or users they have somewhat different needs. And they're all very legitimate needs. If you fast forward 10 or 20 years, then yes, most of these things that people need should be in your product. But then the question is, what do you build now? And in what order do you build it? What do you ignore or eliminate altogether in order to create the optimum value over the long term for the product and the business? It is a question that I get asked the most in uh, my advising conversations with fast growing startups. And I think before we get into any kind of frameworks or principles or even tactics around how to prioritize, how to know what to build, what to ignore, I like to point out this is where your strategy is extremely vital. And strategy is unfortunately such a misunderstood and misused word in the Valley and many other places. People will sometimes create a detailed project plan and then call it a strategic plan. And uh, they'll say, this is my strategy. Whereas it's not a strategy, it's a list of things to do. The strategic prefix, the word strategic prefixed to another noun is really problematic. Whether it's a strategic roadmap or strategic priorities uh, or a strategic plan doesn't automatically make something a strategy. I think strategy is really about having clarity. Who are you building this product for? And making choices around how you are going to win whatever win means uh, for you and maybe define that as well. I think a lot of these problems that you that manifest as execution problems in fast growth startups as well as larger companies, in my observation, are actually problems around not either having a strategy or the strategy is uh, perhaps in the head of product's uh, head or is in the founder's head and it has not been articulated. And so the team doesn't know what the strategy is. And so every time they run into, should we do X or Y, they reach this place of deadlock. And then things get escalated to the head of product or they get escalated to the CEO. And now the head of product or CEO is frustrated. Why can't my teams be more self-managing? Why do I have to mediate all these conversations or opine on all these trade-offs and priorities? The observation is it's actually a problem that you as the head of product or you as the CEO uh, need to address for your team. Again, a lot goes back to having that clarity around strategy yourself. And once you have that clarity, making sure that it's clear to everybody else on the company. And that requires work both in terms of it's not just you wrote the strategy and you're done and you send an email. You have to keep repeating it. This is something I learned the hard way as a leader myself where I would go to an all hands for my group uh, and I would talk to the entire team and I would say, this is what we are trying to do. This is why we are trying to do it. And I would prepare well for that discussion and for that presentation. Uh, And at the end of the presentation, I'd be like, yes, my job here is done. Well, it turns out that people are going to forget. And in a fast growth company or a team, you're going to have new people join. So sometimes the CEO job in a fast growth startup or the head of products job is uh, not the CEO role or the CPO role. It's really the chief repeating officer role, right? Like you just keep repeating the the strategy and then put it in context with the mission uh, and make sure that everybody is working on those things in alignment with your values. That is the core job. But once you reach that stage, which very few teams do, frankly, but once you reach that stage where there is a very rigorous strategy and people understand the strategy and people's day-to-day, month-to-month actions are coherent with that strategy, then you will notice that the vast majority of your problems around prioritization and what to do 
actually go, right? Because people can reference like, oh, yes, this is a pillar of our strategy and this feature is going to help this pillar. So therefore, it's more important than this other random ask we got from some customer that wants it next month, as an example. So that helps. And then after that, you can start applying some basic prioritization frameworks. And I'm happy to share the, a few that have been useful for me. But the frameworks by themselves are... Uh, not very useful without having a strategy in place. Let me go on the other side of that coin, April, which is that in very competitive markets, and I see from your book as well as some of your other talks like MarTech or sales enablement or whatever, there could yeah. be hundreds or even thousands of companies. So there isn't the giant like a Siebel yeah. or a Salesforce. And how do you think about positioning in like a deep red ocean with so many different players? Any thoughts on that? Because a lot of people, I mean, the good news about that yeah. thing is if there are 5,000 companies, there's a real market because there's, you know, buyers are buying. Bad news is if you are entrant number 5,001, God help you, right? Like how are you going to God make inroads exactly. and get the sales velocity? Yeah. So the key thing there is it kind of comes down to the same stuff, interestingly, is like, what do you have that's differentiated? What's the value of those differentiators? And then who cares a lot about that? value and can you just focus on those folks and get and start getting your accelerated revenue that way so it, you mentioned sales enablement so I'll give you an example there so it's a company that I work with here in Toronto and they're in the sales enablement space and it's terrible there's like a thousand companies in there and half the stuff's not even sales enablement and they call it sales enablement so there's like training software that they're calling sales enablement but it was never built for that or a CMS that they're calling sales enablement but it was never built for that and so this company, I worked with them. And when I started working with them, if you looked at their website, it wasn't clear how they were any different than any of the other sales. Like they were talking about better sales enablement and training your reps fast and having your reps love the experience. And it's the same stuff as everybody else is talking about. And so what we did was I spent some time digging into why do people pick you? Like you're selling stuff right now. You've got a certain amount of traction right now. Why do folks pick you? Well, it turns out, again, their big differentiator was they're the only sales enablement software that's built on top of Salesforce. And you say, okay, that's the feature. Well, so what? What's the value of that feature? Well, the value of that feature is I can measure whether or not the sales enablement is working using sales data, because I'm all integrated into the Salesforce database. So what that means is I do the sales enablement and then I can see, does that reduce time to first deal or time to meet quota or whatever? I can look at what my best sales reps are doing versus my worst sales reps and understand how my sales enablement can close the gap. So once we understood that, then it's like, okay, that's the value. Then you say, well, who cares a lot about that? If I'm hiring a lot of sales reps and growing fairly quickly, then every day my reps not making quota costs me a lot of money. Um, and I'm going to have some of those reps are going to be bad and, and I'm going to have to fire them or they're going to churn out. And so I want to know that as quickly as possible. So this idea of being able to measure the impact of sales enablement with sales data is really important for those kinds of companies. So if I'm level jump, what do I do? Well, the first thing is I focus in on those kinds of companies. And then the second thing I do is I focus in on that differentiator. So what these guys do is they come in and they say, look, you know, and they're generally selling to the head of sales enablement. So they get into meeting with the head of sales enablement and they're like, look, you get sales enablement's important, right? Because why is it important? Because every day your rep's not making quota costs you a lot of money. In fact, here's the research on how much money it costs you. And it's like a lot, millions, right? <laughs> so it's costing you money. And it's like, so how are we solving that problem today? Well, if you look at all the solutions out in the market, some of them are just a CMS. It's just putting stuff on a shared drive and doing version control. Like that's okay. You know, you make sure everybody's using the right stuff, but I don't know if anything's working or I have an LMS and that's a little bit better. I can tell who took the course and you know, what days did they take it and all that, but did, does it tell you whether or not your sales enablement stuff is work? It doesn't. So you know what, in a perfect world, we'd have a sales enablement product that would allow us to measure the impact of that sales enablement with data. 
right? Absolutely. Now in that pitch, I didn't even pitch you the product. I just pitched you my point of view on the world. I just pitched you like, look, like if we're going to like, do you agree that this is important? If you say yes, as a customer at this point, I got you. I'm the only game in town. And so if I can get you aligned to that point of view that, hey, what's the point of doing this if we don't have any sales data? Well, then you're going to pick Level Jump because Level Jump's the only company that does that. So that's the key. I got to figure out what my differentiator is, but I can't stop there. I got to be able to figure out what's the value of that. It's not just that they're built on Salesforce. It's what does building on Salesforce get me as a company? It gets me this insight into whether or not my stuff's working. So switching gears a little bit, as companies now are pretty large, several hundred million dollars of revenue, uh, publicly traded company. Can you talk a little bit about the buildup to becoming publicly traded as a product person? I think uh, because oftentimes when you're a venture funded, privately held company, you, you can sort of take a lot of shortcuts, you can revisit things, you can restate numbers, all of these things, they don't really matter as much. But the preparation for an IPO, and, and then of course, subsequently the responsibilities what is your advice to startups, right? Since you've lived through the journey, right? I mean, how early should they start thinking about it and worrying about it? And what's the right thing to do? Start thinking about it immediately. Start living and working as if you were a public company. Don't have goals that you can, it's okay to restate the numbers. Really try to get into that discipline of making sure that what you say you're going to do, you do. Have the right conversations with your customers. Don't get into revenue recognition issues where you're promising a bunch of things. Start early with a discipline because the discipline is really critical. And it, again, builds that culture. If you try all of a sudden to say, oh, next year we're going to IPO and we have to change the culture of this organization to be thinking like a public company, it's really hard to do. It's very hard to pivot. And I would tell you that Coupa, for many years prior to the IPO, we operated as if we were a public company with the same discipline, the same mindset, the same mentality of closing out the quarter, of not getting into revenue recognition issues, not over committing to our customers, being authentic, being honest, and, and doing what we said we were going to do. So I would really counsel everyone as soon as possible, just act as if you were a public company. What are the standards that you would have to live to? But start practicing the right hygiene, the right practices, the right models. And in a product organization, practice it there as well, which is, again, don't overcommit. Don't get into situations where you're promising the customers the world. Walk away from deals if you need to. Have the courage to say no when what this customer is wanting from you if it doesn't fit what your goals and your strategies are for your organization. And that's a really hard thing to do in those earliest days. At Coupa, we walked away from plenty of deals where there just was not alignment, that we were not aligned to that same goal. Sure, it's hard, right? The customer is ready to throw a lot of money at you. But ultimately, you have to decide, are you in it for a short term or are you in it for that marathon long term? So you come up with an idea, a lot of hard work and some luck you stumble upon what seems like a product you create a few instances of it, give it to a few friendly customers initially. And after that, some are in the next level, which is sort of, let's say, a beta phase. And you see some initial successes. But along the way, you need the healthcare ecosystem to also appreciate what you're doing and validate a lot of what you're doing. So how did that journey happen? Can you share some insights into that part of your journey? So, you know, it is one of the most critical parts. Healthcare cannot be done without having healthcare deep involved from the uh, right from the time when we embarked on the journey. So with few contacts that we had uh, with few hospitals, doctors, we started approaching and bouncing off the idea that, you know, what we are trying to do. In this first to get latched on, that was, of course, Nimhans, right? Because one of the problems that even they were facing on everyday basis was that doing a sleep study, uh, the awareness levels are very low and that sleep study is very cumbersome process. So what the human sleep research labs saw in Dozy was that if this actually comes to a success, 
this is going to help us automate this entire process and is going to make it very easy for client and what is today a very technician oriented procedure in fact putting those 32 electrode takes almost one and a half hours and that too with a precision he actually became our very good friend dr gulshan so when by the time he used to start putting his last electrode i used to fall asleep on the chair itself right not even there one and a half hours what a through some time that we have to do a pre prep and end prep and everything right so it was a painful procedure they thought that you know this will become very easy for them right so and then they latched on to that so which was our first uh, insight into the uh, hospital where they you know opened up their doors to work with us very closely but similar thing then happened right idea is that at the end of it we require only one or two to start with doctors who really believe in what we have as a vision and they are ready to work with you as a co collaborators in uh, what you are trying to achieve right but you know after hitting it with 40 50 at least you have to require as one who really believes in you who believes in the product and more than that believes in the people who are running it and uh, that's how it is and it is true for everyone sanjay i think same thing we have also spoken about how it happens uh, with your key employees how it happens with your key investors how it happens with your key collaborators right so rejection is just a phase of it you have to keep on doing it till you don't find the perfect ones and once you have that then latch on to it build on the relationship and go ahead with them and all that it takes is just convincing one or two or three key opinion leaders so uh, many a times these things don't uh, pan out as one would have uh, thought and sometimes they can even backfire especially when there are cultural differences or you know speaking across zoom face to face is often quite different because you see the full body language and everything like that but sometimes it's very hard to read eyes of people and so on so what are some examples of things that may have backfired and sometimes famously or you know and, and what are some tips to ensure that people are not making a huge blunder as they are trying to be funny it's a great question well sticking with dick costello for a moment one thing that we know is especially at high status levels self deprecation is so powerful and now we have these four humor styles which we will talk about in a minute but we know that dick is the sniper stand up style of humor and so he tends to build intimacy through teasing now the problem for a high profile ceo who wants to build intimacy through teasing is that it can come off as punching down it can come off as sort of making fun of people of lower status and so especially with a global audience he'd be leading these all hands with thousands of people around the world dialed in he had to make sure that his humor wasn't coming across in an inappropriate way and so what he did was he actually had some of his team members join him on stage and he would encourage them to make fun of him basically however you would treat me normally behind the scenes i want you to treat me that way and one of these people was april underwood who's a longtime colleague and senior product director at at twitter so the two of them knew each other very well and he would bring her up on stage and she would just rip into him it was playful it was funny but it was also you know self deprecating and the the fact that it was unplanned that it was unfolding in the moment made it even funnier and of course it was a really safe way to do this because dick and april could play off of each other in a way that felt completely natural and fun without it feeling preplanned or without feeling too sniper or stand upy this is something that larry page and sergey brin did too along with eric schmidt at google so eric told us about not long after google's founding Larry and Sergey instituted these hour-long company-wide meetings at the end of each week called TGIF. Thank goodness it's Friday. Right. And for the first 30 minutes, the team just reviewed news and product launches for the week, but it was really anchored on them also showcasing their personalities with each other. And especially this sort of witty repartee between the two of them and later between Eric as well was often a real highlight. and it continued to reinforce the culture that they were building there as well your own journey going from being a game designer to a general manager to a product manager to running your own studio as an entrepreneur and so forth 
So what are the skills that you've learned that sort of, you know, helped you across and, and in terms of cross-pollination to the extent that if somebody was a general manager today or a manager or an engineer wanting to go the other route, become a game mm-hmm. designer, how versatile is that sort of path of learning? That is one thread. And the other thread, maybe I'll, I'll pause here, but is really the multiple different verticals you've worked in. On the first one, I, I feel like a lot of product building, it requires this sort of cross-pollination where being a jack of all trades and master of none, I think it's an over term. But if you really think about it, what it requires is breadth more than depth in a lot of areas. I think you need depth in one or two areas, but you need a lot more uh, because a part of being a product builder, a part of being a product manager, a successful product manager at least, is being able to work with other people. So I think... One of the big things there is that do you have a deep appreciation for what engineers do on a day in and day out basis? What do uh, you know designers do on a day in and day out basis? The the kind of work that uh, marketeers do and uh, folks on partnerships and business development do. And I think that bit of just sort of being the glue that holds the team together and being able to work in this cross functional way it requires you to have enough breadth that when you sit in a room with people very different from you, who who do a very different function from you, are you able to listen, absorb, make sense of what they are telling you, and then contribute in a positive way? And I think, uh, to me, I think when people talk about a breadth of skills, I think to me, that is sort of the theme, the motif, so to say, which runs across all these things that are you able to go and contribute within these different rules? I never diminish the sort of, the ability for people to be subject matter experts in a particular domain or sort of just have insane depth because without those people, you don't get things built, right? But those are people you bank on. So the 10X engineer or sort of those phenomenal designers and engineers, you need them to build great products. But there is a great utility for people who can just go across different functions and, and again, do all the three levels of this job function. I I sort of have this, you know, the Simon Sinek start with the why framework always sort of seems very applicable to me when it comes to product manager's job, which is the why, how, and what. Why are we doing what we are doing? And why would people care if we did this? Why would our users care if we did this? And to me, that's actually strategy. So that's the first layer. Why build this? Why do this? Why should I be doing this? Why should we collectively be building this, right? And that sort of is the strategic part of any function, but I think very critical for product managers. The second bit is, how should we build this? How should we go about solving this problem, which is very clearly the domain of tactics. And then there's the bottom layer, which is what? What should we be doing, right? What should be the steps that we take? And I think that's very clearly in the realm of execution. Now, if we take a sort of a diagonal line through this or create a wedge through this, like a pyramidical wedge, Execution is obviously critical. When we start off in our careers, we have to be very good at executing. And then over time, we become better at tactics and hopefully at some point become really good with strategy. But to be able to function in this very cross-functional way and be able to go across this, especially in a startup environment, I think all three things are required. So again, it's sort of more breadth versus depth. You're a great phenomenal strategic thinker. You have a role in the startup world, but there is a limitation to what you'd be able to do if you can't execute and you can't come up with tactics. Similarly, you're great. You're a machine. You're a beast in execution, but you don't have strategic depth or you don't have tactical depth. You will struggle. So I think which is where as PM, having all these three abilities is great. So again, it's more of breadth as opposed to sort of depth. There's a beautiful quote I remember, which is that startups are hard because both the problem and the solution are unknown. Well, we had a lot of interesting entrepreneurs and CXOs talk about identifying opportunities. Shopify has a very inspirational mission to make everybody an entrepreneur. I remember the episode with Varga Bakshi on opportunities in cross-border commerce. Viral Shah talked a bit about open source business models and all kinds of interesting opportunities that are there. I would be remiss in not not mentioning Nick Kill Jakarta's episode around doing interesting things in healthcare. Nishchit Shetty talked about interesting opportunities in the crypto space, Tarun Mehta in the EV space and so forth. 
So it, a lot of these entrepreneurs talk not just about the opportunities that they see, but also interesting frameworks on how to identify these opportunities. So without further ado, here are some more interesting snippets. So what are some emerging trends that you see of new things that either customers are asking for or trends that you see emerging? We at Prime Ventures do a lot in fintech. Uh, and you know, so are there other interesting applications uh, that you're seeing already emerge in the Indian context? Uh, or either being pulled from the customer side or even from the on the B2B side, on, on the classic sort of real world, old world, finance, NBFCs, banks, etc. Are there any interesting use cases that you're seeing? Timing is going to be prime out here. But I think uh, on the B2B side, what you spoke about, there's a plethora of things not done. Uh, first example, white labeled uh, crypto exchanges, because I believe as regulation, we get near it. Every bank, every financial institution would want to offer this to their customers. And being able to service them with the right uh, software for them to make it happen. Because building this software is one of the more difficult ones. But I think you can commoditize this to a large extent so that all the financial institutions can provide. And that's a great opportunity. The second is custody. Custody is still not really a completely solved problem. Both institutional custody. I think retail custody, there are still international products, ledger and all. Again, very expensive. 7,000, 6,000 rupees for a ledger device. I don't think it's for uh, you know us in India right now to buy, but someone can build an India solution. But there are also custody solutions for corporates and institutions that have not been built from an India perspective. And then there are quite a few, but I'm not a B2B guy, so I wouldn't have deep insights there. But in B2C, what is happening is the, the beautiful thing is uh, now because we have about 15 to 20 million people in India, now the Indian market is uh, priming up for decentralization. So let's say a, a year or a year and a half ago, if you we were building a decentralized protocol or a solution for India, I wouldn't be a big believer because the market was small. There were 5 million, 6 million people. And let's say 10 to 15% of the people get into DeFi right now. So that's about 500, 600K people that you have to reach out. Uh, that's your total market. It's too small. Now what is happening is you have 1 to 2 million people in India who are open to DeFi decentralization. So now I, I'll, I, we are seeing that emergence of DeFi protocols and de uh, decentralized apps focused on the Indian market. And I think that is going to grow. And in the next uh, two to three years, I believe uh, India will cross 100 million people in crypto or holders of crypto. And what will happen is you will have there will those 10, 20, 30 million people who want to be into DeFi. Uh, so that will be like the rapid growth in the next, I think the next uh, three to four years that is going to happen. So now is a great time to build uh, for decentralization. And the best thing about decentralization is you don't have to worry about local laws and regulations. You don't have to run India Wants Crypto campaign. It's amazing. You just have to be a developer and an entrepreneur and just build. So I think uh, that is going to be the next evolution. Yeah, Nishal, just to make it real for our listeners, are there examples of very low-hanging fruit? I don't mean like startup ideas. I just mean what do customers, what do consumers want in DeFi? Is it just, you know yield farming or making some you know value out of their assets or are there certain basic things right or lending or you know, what is it that is some of the early ones that you think will uh, succeed i'll give you an example of i think the first step will be probably a crossover from uh, centralization to decentralization like in the us there are products which uh, uh, are centralized and uh, you put in your assets and then they use decentralized protocols to give you a better yield so we could start with that for India uh, right now, where a centralized uh, kind of a service where I can put my assets and then they'll use the decentralized because decentralization is still hard for people uh, who are new into crypto to use DeFi protocols directly. So that crossover apps will come. So the first generation was us, completely centralized, where we just helped you get into decentralization. The second generation is going to be CFI and DeFi. So centralized and uh, decentralized together. And probably then after that will be the third generation, which is purely DeFi. So right now, you can look at those crossovers. No need to innovate and build a completely new product for India, but to help India onboard to these uh, existing yield farming and staking and everything that you can think of. I don't think we have more than a few tens of maybe 10, 20,000 people into these uh, protocols today from India. So how do you take this to a million people in India being involved in these uh, protocols? I think that's where uh, the opportunities are right now. So if I were an early stage entrepreneur looking to start a new quote unquote data business, and it need not be in the financial sector, whether it's public market or private market, because as we always say, data is exploding and metadata is exploding even more exponentially. How would you go about analyzing that opportunity as a founder to say, is there something interesting here or not? 
you know, one of, one of my favorite businesses is App Annie. They, they basically give you data and metadata and analytics about App Store data from Google and Apple. So just curious about any, any thoughts on how one should evaluate this. So on evaluating the opportunity, I would say two things. One is basically the opportunity has to be large enough or the addressable market has to be large and growing. Uh, to give you an example, how do you size a market? For instance, if you do VC and PE, uh, when we started 10 years back, there was no market. So they were not using the software per se. And this was a new wallet. Share. So the size is not based on the actual industry players are doing. You have to basically like unfold the market and see if this is a large enough market, if data is going to be a critical part in that decision making, and if the sector as such is growing. Right? So that is what I would say is sizing the opportunity. And again, it's uh, typically not the current wallet share, but how, what potential it can uh, become. Right? That's one. The second thing I would say is your affinity towards the market. I think that is probably most important. How do you your sort of connect what I would say as a founder problem fit or a founder market fit. I think that is also essential because data businesses is you're typically selling to enterprises. It's B2B. It may not be the most sexy business uh, as a, a consumer business, which is having a lot of eyeballs, etc. And it takes time for you to get better at data. So I think this is something that requires also a little bit of investment and you have to you know bear with it. So I would say you know, the second thing would be like, you know, how deeply do you connect to the, uh, to the problem? Because it will take you a few years to become really good and your sales to become really easy. Understood. How do you evaluate the moat in your business or the defensibility of your business? And for that matter, any data business, really, because a lot of the data that you are today presenting and making it easily accessible, searchable, analyzable is data from the kind of public sources of information or semi-public sources of information. How do you think about it? This is a very interesting question. Uh, easy way to think about this is actually thinking the parallel from the public markets. If you look at public markets, all the data is public. Uh, a lot of it is structured information, but still you have companies like Bloomberg who keeps growing and a lot of people who have come at that market in not being able to sort of take enough market share. So you have, you know, free solutions like a Google Finance or even a lot of other, uh, you know, solutions like that, but still enterprise grade data, which is very usable, curated, that has still value. So in general, in data businesses, building enterprise grade data is not trivial. And once you have that, I think th there's uh, inherent defensibility that is there in the business. And then just to add, I think to that point, like, uh, so that's in the market. But if you are a company who's building that, there are a few things that you obviously have to you know, get right. I think the top two things I would say is definitely tech because you know, you're going to be working with a lot of uh, data. You have to be intelligent at mining those, et cetera. Right? So you really need to invest in tech upfront from day one. Uh, I think that's, that goes a long way uh, you know, to build a defensibility in your business. All the companies, interestingly, actually in our cohort, there were actually two or three companies which got started, which uh, did not own the IP for the data and the, which actually licensed the data. And none of them actually exist today. So you have to really own the IP of your core data. You have to have the tech to be able to build it at a fairly fast uh, you know, pace. So that is one thing that goes on to the long-term defensibility. And I think the other thing is that if you're building, don't shy away uh, from also having people the, the ones which are required to build enterprise grade data, because again, tech can solve probably you know, 90, 95 percent of the problem, but that five percent is actually very valuable for the users. What are the next set? You know, some entrepreneur thinking about getting into the EV space now to try to improve customer experience, right? Of course, manufacturing ethers is a highly uh, not only innovative process, but also expensive process, right? You set up factories and plants, and like that's where you're sitting today. But how do you think about uh, what are some of the newer areas that could be interesting for entrepreneurs to consider that could dramatically improve the customer experience? EVs may. I think so. I think everything around how service is delivered and how the entire ownership cycle ends, right? Like, like actually how it even begins. Ownership models are starting to change quite a lot. Right? Like people no longer just need to, and I'm not talking about ride sharing. I am still talking about ownership. Like ride sharing's gone through a difficult phase last year. And I think a lot of people seem to have sort of concluded that they do want to own vehicles now. 
but it is for that i'm talking about ownership and i think there is an opportunity to sort of solve like think of a lot of urban customers they want to buy the na- latest generation vehicle and with electric vehicles and connected vehicles the latest generation is changing every 18 months but the typical ownership period is 5 to 6 years and the process of changing ownership is very complicated right like how do you get rid of a vehicle how do you sell them who buys them how to finish the rta process it's all really broken patching that by by new ownership models i think there's a massive opportunity there and a, and a big source of customer happiness fix getting generating customer happiness and second is how do you deliver vehicle servicing i think it's one that we are certainly solving it trying to solve it either but it remains a fairly broken piece because every automotive company has decided to make this a massive source of revenue the experience has gone for a complete toss so i think fixing these two things could drive a lot of customer happiness and and hence could be big sources of value in the coming years i want to double click on several things here one is that <coughs> you might be afraid of quote unquote sleeping with the enemy because you're like let's say you're competing as well if it's a clear segregated thing then there's no problem right like microsoft's right. not doing okrs ali.io is doing okrs or at yeah. least obviously so so it's fine we can talk we can partner in other cases you feel like no we are partly competing partly collaborating and they will learn more about us so you'll always have that paranoia kind of thing mm-hmm. as a founder So any thoughts on number 1 that number 2 like you said in most companies and I used to be at Google and and do OKRs and so forth as well is that the business leaders or the product leaders typically are the big drivers of the acquisition not the cop dev folks cop dev folks right. come towards the end and help close the deal and the terms and and kind of take it through the process so maybe if you can talk about both like how do you overcome the fear of paranoia that they will quote unquote steal our stuff or they will know how much traction we really have and that kind of stuff especially when you're on this thing and how do you make the relationships with the product business leaders uh, not just mm-hmm. cop dev so on the first point my philosophy is that you don't really have to be that afraid of your competition especially larger you know competitors because they are slow to move and they probably already you know with with what you're doing how many users you have and so forth it's better to establish a relationship you you may not enter into a relationship with them at that point but it's better to establish a dialogue uh, with them and even potentially explore a partnership for example when i was doing limoca which is a language learning startup we established a relationship with pearson which is a very large education company and they had their own language learning products but we were really not very concerned about them having something that could compete with limoca which was a social language learning platform And in fact we ended up with a uh, partnership with them where we decided to you know license their content and uh, build a relationship around that now they they ultimately did not acquire us but they could have certainly been an off live moca we ended up selling to rosetta stone instead but even there we had a conversation with rosetta stone fairly early on when we were not even talking about an acquisition the ceo reached out to me he was in town he wanted to have a chat and i said you know sure I'd uh, be happy to have a discussion. You may want to keep certain things close to your chest, but there's no reason why you can't have a conversation with your competitors. Now, to your second point about corp dev versus the product side, I'm a big believer in establishing relationships with the business leaders as opposed to corp dev because they are the ones who make the ultimate decision on whether to acquire or not. So in the case of Hotmail, for example, I was the product leader, the business leader, within MSN and I was the one who made the evaluation of Hotmail and decided that we needed to build Hotmail and then once I had convinced management then I got the finance team involved in the acquisition process now that process works differently if you're hiring an investment bank but with an investment bank their relationships are typically with the corp dev people and then they go through that gateway uh, to the business leaders and get you know feedback and whether an acquisition is possible so really it depends on the situation but i'm a big believer in reaching out to the business folks for let's say i'm a founder of a company and i want to make a relationship with somebody in i don't know sales force or or something yeah. else any kind of practical tips or thoughts on on how do you kind of do that because you obviously not going to like randomly send a you know linkedin email saying hey i'm <laughs> such and such and i'd love to talk to you because you're a svp product at salesforce right well there are a number of ways you can uh, do that certainly uh, you want to establish yourself on their marketplace and drive a good amount of revenue through their marketplace they are certainly tracking your sales right because uh, they can track how much you're selling through their marketplace 
So they'll have a good sense for what companies are doing really well on their marketplace. The second way that you can uh, do this is through your common customers, because your common customers will demand a certain level of integration beyond what may be immediately obvious. They may want deeper integration with somebody like Salesforce. And that will also create an opportunity for you to have a conversation with the product teams to say, hey, can you give us better access? Can we work closely to you know, provide better integration for our customers? And then, of course, through your board, your advisors, those are some of the ways that you can get in touch with a large company. How big is cross-border commerce, particularly, again, since you're based in South Asia and in, in particular in India, from an India outbound perspective, has that taken off? How is that looking with respect to, to the data that you've seen over the last five, six years? Cross-border commerce has been a very fascinating concept for Shopify over the last four or five years. One of our missions today is to connect every merchant in the world with every buyer in the world. But cross-border commerce comes with its own complexities, especially in logistics. So we are a technology company. We are first solving the problems at a technology level when it comes to cross-border commerce. So that's part one. What has really already picked up is the concept of dropshipping, which is again cross-border largely today. We have seen a lot of merchants from India or in Southeast Asia pick up products from China and sell it directly into the U.S., and European countries. So Shopify actually acquired a company called Oberlo some years back. It's a, it's a Lithuanian company. Oberlo has tie-ups with suppliers in China. So anyone in Asia or Europe can pick up products uh, from suppliers in China and then sell it into the US So and just put a profit margin and make money off it. They don't even have to hold inventory, which makes it really simple for anyone to start uh, a business and understand, let's say, how e-commerce works just by uh, testing waters through drop shipping. So uh, drop shipping as a cross border concept has really picked up. But overall, I think direct to consumer brands were. Pro- so let's take the example of some brands in India. We've seen so many brands in India who uh, are doing remarkably well domestically, but are just uh, not very confident when it uh, comes to selling internationally. And those are problems that we need to solve as an ecosystem and there's a large part that logistics companies also need to play to make it simpler for uh, merchants to understand compliance uh, you know rules around customs tax duties etc so i think there's more that can be done we come up with content and playbooks to help merchants do cross-border commerce but i think there's more uh, to be done there for from all of us Great, Shihab. Let's talk about the global SaaS market and all kinds of interesting new SaaS companies coming out of India. I know you avidly follow this uh, everywhere across the globe. So can you talk about some of the trends that you are seeing in terms of the overall global SaaS market? Overall, what we are seeing is companies are turning a lot more a product-led approach. Just to give you a, a little history of how SaaS is actually changing, right? For some of us, it is still SaaS, but there is a transition which happened from 2000 to 2020. In 2000s, uh, it was all sales-led companies like Salesforce, which is the first uh, SaaS company, probably the one who invented cloud and uh, they created an amazing product and they directly started selling into the C-level suit, a field level sales people who will directly go and sell into the C suit. And which is which might not be affordable to that point, which was not affordable to SMBs also, because that model will not scale for a SMB business. But if you take is like, okay, next set of companies, you take HubSpot, you take Zendesk, you take Freshdesk, everything. Those were marketing led companies. Basically, you have an amazing product. Then you do is like, okay, you have an amazing marketing team, which will get people inbound marketing using the inbound marketing, either via Google AdWords or via content, everything is you have word of mouth or whatever it is, you are attracting people to your website and there is an inquiry and then you are actually is like 
selling to them and that actually made it affordable to mid market and even to a uh, higher end of smb but if you see again is like the journey in 2015 to 2020 you can see today slack is becoming the new sensation then monday.com is another company or uh, notion is there all these companies has got a common thread is there it is all about the product led growth basically the lower end of the uh, pyramid that means the analyst or uh, the person who is really using this product and you made it completely freemium and you allow them to use it and after using it they will go and tell your boss hey this is amazing product for example notion that is happening see i myself heard is at least five times from employees i wanted to use so you don't have a choice you have to buy an enterprise license of notion so that everybody in the company can use it so that is the typical product led story so this is what is the trend which is happening in the last 20 years so the change of sales led to marketing led to product led is happened now the next thing which i am seeing is one of the things as you move up the market now a data center or data security is becoming increasingly is right earlier nobody used to ask is only enterprises used to ask do you have a soc2 report are you iso today even smb or uh, uh, mid market started asking are you uh, uh, iso are you uh, a soc compliant uh, maybe because today nobody goes beyond the, the on premise solution so if you take probably 5 year uh, or 8 year back people still were hybrid they were people who will still buy in the on premise and then they were installing it inside because of all these data privacy concerns today even they are moving towards cloud but only criteria are they now instead of uh, pushing you the physical criteria now they actually created a policy where inside the policy they are writing okay we need the data center to be inside our country that is a policy number what and then is like iso compliant then is like all those kind of that is another thing which we are seeing Tell us about your company, uh, so Julia Computing. From what I understand, it started in 2015. So, what was the motivation behind that, and what made you say, okay, you know what, this is a, a open source project, but I really need to start a company now? The company was a response to market demand. So, we were always profitable from day one because we had people who wanted our services. We we incorporated uh, the company back in 2015 and started out with our first few customers, mostly in finance back then. And what we realized uh, was that the traditional sort of thought process around business models in open source was you sell enterprise support and consulting. And, and both of those are very um, human intensive, the service industry, as well as supporting customers. And of course, you have to do that when you're sort of, sort of a new and a young programming language and everything is changing all the time and there isn't enough talent in the market. But what it what we realized is that it took away from our time to contribute to Julia, right? Because every time me or my co-founders were writing code for a customer, we were not writing code for Julia itself. And many of those engagements were very enlightening in terms of understanding what the customer demand was. But we realized that we do need to build a product-oriented company. And now that's easier said than done, but it at least became very clear to us in the, in the first year of operation. And back then, I spent a lot of time also talking to you as well. So I, I kind of understood what it took to start a company and what it took to make it successful just from those early conversations. So finally, in 2016, we decided to raise our first round of capital. And we did that with General Catalyst and Founder Collective. Of course, we were still thinking that, okay, it's open source, so we're just going to follow the tried and tested path of what Red Hat has done, what MongoDB had done, what Elastic had done. And if you look at all these companies today, I mean, they've taken so many different paths. And people like to call it the open source business model. But as you get closer into each of the companies, you, you'll find that actually there is nothing common around their business models. And that every open source company has had to figure out what its path to market was. And increasingly, a lot of them are focusing on cloud as the way to build a large scalable business. But the, the challenges being faced by Elastic, especially with AWS and, and the incentives and the, and the structures are sort of, you know, uh, sort of headline news nowadays, at least in tech media, right? We, we took our time. So, you know, we, we raised our, two, uh, our first seed round uh, in 2016, and then we subsequently raised our Series A in 2021, which is uncommon for a startup. But it was not because we were growing too slowly or, or we were sort of not knowing what to do. We really wanted to be sure about what that business model is. 
And because we were very frugal in terms of how we set up our business and how we ran our business, we were able to give ourselves the time and also able to grow uh, by finding other sources of funds in, you know, that were non-dilutive, right? Uh, customer contracts, R&D grants, and so on and so forth. So we were able to grow the company to what would have been a traditional Series A level company with early product market fit, a team of about 40 people, had 10 or 15 big enterprise logos, all of that stuff. But the business model was not yet clear to us for the first few years of the business. We also spent a lot of time taking Julia to 1.0, so which was only in 2018. And the focus on business and customers, you know, even though as we were building it, it took us some time to figure it out, but now it's very clear to us what our path is and, and why this can be a breakout company in the technical computing arena. I'd like to point out that the, the total addressable market for technical computing software today is about $10 billion in annual recurring revenue. Um, and, and that takes, you know, there, there is, uh, you know, there, there are all the languages that we talked about, some of which are commercial. But there are, you know, companies that do engineering simulation, pharmaceutical simulation, chemical simulation, and multi-physics simulation. All of these put together, computer aided design, it's a very large uh, circuit simulation, right? It's a very large total addressable market. And what we realized is that while Julia gives all of our users superpowers, right, like the thousand X that that you also brought up, we asked the question: What if we could also leverage that same thousand X that we give to our customers ourselves? And what can we build on top of Julia that could actually be something uh, that could be game changing? And here's what we came up with. So we said that we are going to build Julia Hub, which is our cloud platform on which we are going to provide the best Julia experience anyone can get anywhere in the world. You get there, you fire a VS code, you write all your uh, Julia packages, everything's available. You click a button, deploy to GPUs or thousands of CPUs scale it up. Basically, it gives you a supercomputer at your fingertips to someone who is not DevOps, you know, familiar with DevOps, someone who's an engineer, someone who's a data scientist. And then we took it one step further and we said we are going to build domain-specific software on top of it, I mean, whether it's in pharmaceutical simulation or engineering or circuit simulation. And so we took that path of building a suite of Julia-powered domain-specific, industry-specific applications on the cloud as a path to market. And that is how we define ourselves as a company. You know, perhaps uh, pivot is probably sometimes uh, a misunderstood word, but adapt to the, the changing world. And right. you've done that while still remaining in the core area of conversational uh, messaging for corporates for the most part. So how should ad- entrepreneurs look at such moments? I would say in payments in India, if you think about from cards to wallets and now to UPI again there have been these moments where you know the business has completely changed what thoughts would you give for to entrepreneurs to look out for these moments and to grab them that's a great uh, question and I think every disruption or maybe even a paradigm shift right really is both it's clearly both in a a threat and an opportunity so it's a threat to incumbent players it's an opportunity for newer players and entrepreneurs have to navigate that. And not just here, but you know, you look at companies, long-standing companies like Apple and Microsoft and even Google have had to navigate the desktop era to the web era to the mobile era and cloud and so on. So I think the only thing in our industry, the only thing constant is change. So the way to adjust, I think at least the thing that's worked for me really is you need to be one at a minimum aware of it, but that's not enough because I think peering into the future is a little overrated. I mean, yes, you can anticipate, but these are systemic changes. These are large, complex systems with multiple players, and it's really hard to predict everything. So the way I like to think of it is you have to uh, hedge, you have to tinker, you have to experiment. You have to devote a certain amount, you know, if you're an established company, you have to devote a certain amount of your resources and teams just on futuristic experimental stuff. Or if you're an entrepreneur, you devote some of your time to that thing and say, just play with it and see what the new user experience will be. What are the fundamental assumptions that are going to be changed and modified and who is going to impact and how? And I think at Gupshop, what we've done is we are just constantly, I I put out a founder's note uh, coinciding with the funding thing where I actually have enumerated about, I don't know, eight or 10 innovations that we've done over the last few years. I would say most of them have 
in one way failed by which i mean like some of those ideas were ahead of their time some of those products are were anticipated ecosystem changes that never happened but every one of those innovations certainly moved us forward because we learned something we learned about how it could be we learned about why it didn't work and what's yet to happen but the great thing is the one or two things that did work were really just breakout successes and in a way what happens is you've seen the movie we've seen it i've seen it in sort of earlier versions now it didn't become a commercial success but it was certainly a product success and most importantly it was an educational success just how do you think about it and maybe the analogy is a financial portfolio theory sort of model where you just put some of your resources as a portfolio hedge where if something changes and it grows up it works that way and inherently you know it it may not succeed but you just expect that ab testing trial and error and and so on i think that's the only sort of generic principle now of course if you get specific into certain spaces you can get more detailed or or specific suggestions as well I would love to hear the thoughts of somebody who's a native of bangalore grew up here went to school here did your undergrad and then in and you sort of with the bbva acquisitions sort of had a global view of things right with the european view the not american view and then of course um, looking at the startup ecosystem as a very successful angel investor and and so on so tell us what you're seeing from the outside in uh, on the india front and, and and your thoughts around that so i have this thesis that like uh, history does not repeat but it does rhyme and i think where we are right now is that we are actually at the start in the of probably over the next you know 10 20 30 years of a new cold war there was this era of globalization that started from the fall of the soviet union where the last cold war ended and it was the us was the single superpower the internet was everywhere there was globalization growth india has been transformed china has been transformed so many other parts of the world i think the the that was already beginning to break down a little bit with the 08 financial crisis definitely with you know trump coming to power in the us but also now with this whole covid mess and so the i remember i i first heard this thesis from like jerry yang so even before covid and the thesis is basically that this whole anti china thing that's happening in the us now that's not going to go away just because trump goes away and uh it's going to evolve or maybe devolve into a cold war now it's not going to look exactly like the previous cold war that was different it was all about like nuclear and space races this mm-hmm. one is probably going to end up being the race of the platforms and the the us has a bunch of massive tech platforms the gafa they're called right google apple facebook amazon but so does china china has alibaba tencent and all these like giant companies and we're probably going to see a more like balkanization of the internet and a lot more government supported competition like you would see in the cold war like the us would try to push its companies and the soviets would try to push whatever their capabilities were as well but of course it was communist just like the last cold war this cold war is not going to be fought hopefully with guns and bullets thank god uh, but also it's going to be fought mostly in latin america africa and asia and there's this kind of two separate ways of thinking one is like the us entrepreneurial led tech startup but which is also quite monopolized when you look at the very large companies and then in china you have the state supported system i think just again like the last cold war people who like when jerry yang was telling me this i was like well that makes a lot of sense but i remember in the last cold war india tried to do this thing called the non aligned movement <laughs> and say that there's a third way you don't have to be on the soviet side or the us side you can be your own side and we can pick all the people who don't want to be on one side and make a group of them and it had some impact at least i think when you look at the platforms coming to the similar thing uh, what india has built with the india stack at the base of it is aadhar but with like upi and all the other pieces around it is really a third way it's not like the us which has very very creaky technology when you look at especially the underpinnings of finance and that has enabled monopolies whether it's you know apple facebook or even the banks themselves are an oligopoly in the us um we, visa and visa, visa and mastercard yeah, yeah i mean that is a duopoly right there what india has basically said is we can create 
social goods as infrastructure as a social good and have that built and deployed by the government or the government support and that infrastructure will actually enable this explosion of value creation and innovation on top of that infrastructure but you don't want the underlying infrastructure itself to be controlled either by visa or by alibaba <laughs> you want that to be the access to to that to be democratic and not driven by you know all the games that and you can see so much of it right like in in all the places and, and google apple all of them have their own things and i think that model is truly unique in the globe when you look at it it's not how the us operates it's not how china operates it's not how anybody else operates and yet it is actually super exciting and what's happening in the, in india over the last 4 or 5 years is just insane and there's not a lot of people in the west who still realize that at the highest levels there's awareness but india has that opportunity to be basically say hey uh, there's a third way that third way is actually way better because it allows the creation of a lot more value for the end consumers which is us and if we can do that right i think we're doing it right in india and i think we can then actually act as an example for large parts of the world like you look at like europe and lots of places in africa they're not super happy about this i'm not sure i i like okay, is there a third choice can i have better choices <laughs> and so there's a lot of people who are looking at what that could be and i think they're very interested in where uh, what india has built and i'm hopeful that it becomes not just an indian thing i think even it's just an indian thing i mean india is 1.3 billion people we're, we're, this is big enough right like if we can just solve all of india's problems that's still amazing but we have the opportunity to export it and act as an example for the world over the next decade let me just start with this both your opening comment and the last one which is cultivating an open mindset in fundamentally an organization like the government which is inherently i don't want to say close minded but they're sort of more inward focused and that's where all the notion of sort of bureaucracy and all that kind of comes in uh, so how did that even happen overall right or is it that the success of the things like aadhar and upi and so on led the government to have a more open mindset and therefore it's like a little bit of a virtuous cycle to encourage these other initiatives like open forge and and so forth i would say it's a combination of things amit to me when somebody like nandan nilkani who was the head of the aadhar project he came in and the aadhar team adopted a open architecture whereby the government was helping build uh, this platform but the whole idea was that both the public and the private sectors can actually plug into the platform so it was kind of a radical shift from the way government thinks about whatever they are trying to build it's a, it's a fundamental shift in the way uh, government you know thinks about it but the reason why i think it resonated with the government also was because the government was influenced by what they were seeing in the larger internet and i is going back to my earlier point is that they were looking at i remember when i went to when i joined the government and this whole thing about how much money do you spend on it platforms and uh, you know technologies and when you realize that all these companies like the googles and the yahoos of the world they have actually spent zero money on uh, technologies whereas if you go into the government typically they'd be spending you know, in their it budgets going after proprietary software so at some point in time that question kind of kicks in even within the government that okay how is it that we are spending the these enormous sums of money and yet the end product that we are able to build is not really that great but you look at all these companies which seem to have sprung out of university campuses to people in a garage and they just obviously you don't have the kind of resources that a sovereign government would have so at some point in time they start questioning that what is happening here what is it this big wave that we are missing and i think that's where they would have figured out that okay you really need to understand this whole thing about this open paradigm whether it is open source or whether it is open apis and i think they were kind of you know when they would have looked at something like an aadhar which was coming about in the same way so what nandan nilkani would have done is that he would have actually resonated the same thing that yes you know there is immense value in building something on an open architecture which kind of allows these network effects to kick in so every new addition to the network kind of makes a network more valuable to anybody else who comes in later so i would say it's a combination of you know these multiple a uh, phenomenon that made the government realize the value of this how can people both like the atul sadija of 32 years old who is probably sitting in some startup or the founder of some company or whatever 
get involved in more than just giving money. I mean, we talked about two extremes, right? On the slums of Gurgaon to now you dedicating your life to this amazing and noble cause. How can people contribute in more ways than just money uh, coming from the for-profit or even from the entrepreneurial world? Love to hear some concrete suggestions from you. So Amit, I have seen various models that people have used to uh, to contribute. One extreme is, uh, is is something that I'm very fascinated by, which is the one percent pledge that uh, organizations in US started, Salesforce, Atlassian, many organizations have joined that worldwide. Many of them now have presence in India as well. Basically, it says that as an organization, I could be a startup, I could be a large scale organization. One percent of the organization's top line, bottom line, equity, bandwidth of the employees, whatever I choose, I will contribute to society. It could be just one percent of the employee time, volunteer time that will go. It's a really, really sort of inspirational way to contribute as a startup entrepreneur. So I would encourage all the startups you're funding to consider a one person pledge from their equity, not yours, <laughs> contribute to, to society. I think it kind of puts a very strong anchor on the ground for the founders, for the org to stay connected. I know that it's a big commitment, but a worthy one to consider for sure. Beyond that, we have seen many organizations, if they are not ready for that, at some point in time, they do that. I've been very inspired by Ashish and Book My Show having Book a Smile as an intervention where they encourage their customers to donate. Their customers come forward and donate one rupee, two rupee when they book a, book a ticket. Make My Trip has a very interesting checkout charity and a foundation. I'm sure with your past background, they're sort of fully aware of that. I've seen uh, a Zomato in a very interesting way, acquired a nonprofit, invested in that and created Feeding India, which does uh, you know really, really good work. And during COVID, uh, they did really amazing work. Uh, Nitin from Zeroda started uh, Rain Matter, uh, focusing on climate change. So there are examples where organizations have gone beyond just taking pledges to also concretely start their giving journeys. So these are like sort of more concrete, big ways to do it. But I think uh, many employees in these startups, uh, for example, are also looking at ways to give back. And I've seen that what is easiest is in the long term, the most impactful. The hesitancy is very high. The barriers are very high. So instead of trying to say that, look, till I find the most connectable cause slash nonprofit, I will wait, is not going to work. My advice would be that make it extremely easy for you. Just take a Sunday, call uh, hyper-local nonprofits, uh, search on Google Maps and just make phone calls and just go visit. The minute you start spending time, it starts building on you and you discover whether it is for you or not. So volunteering is the most sort of concrete way. A uh, lot of nonprofits also benefit a lot from people from outside because that level of either technology skills, process skills, uh, even just creative skills, sales, marketing, fundraising are extremely beneficial to the nonprofit sector because the problems are difficult and complex. The resources are limited. So any skills people bring is very useful. So volunteering, donating, advisory board positions, one person pledges, all of these are uh, uh, potential choices that, that exist. Dear listeners, thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. Subscribe now on your favorite podcast app for free and you'll be the first one to know when new episodes are available. Just search for Prime Venture Partners Podcast in Apple Podcast, Spotify, CastBox or however you get your podcasts. Then hit subscribe. And if you have enjoyed the show, we would be really grateful if you leave us a review on Apple Podcast. To read the full transcript, find the link in the show notes.